Okay, conference four is where should I pray? Last one was when should I pray? The one before that was how should I pray? And the one before that was what is prayer? And so here we are at the penultimate conference of the retreat. And the question that arises after we've decided on the when, we have to decide on the where. Virtually, you can pray anywhere you want. You can pray on an airplane, on a train, in a car. You can pray in the hospital. You can pray on the lawnmower. You can pray anywhere. But our Lord tells us in Matthew 6, verse 6, when you pray, go to your private room, close the door, and pray to your Father in that secret place. In one sense, it's not really all that important, the where. St. Paul charges us to pray at all times, which would include all places. However, a space dedicated to prayer will certainly make a big difference. During the pandemic, there was a big hubbub about creating a space in your homes where you could watch the televised masses or the streamed masses. And I know lots of people that would... I thought this was peculiar, but maybe, you, maybe some of you did this. So forgive me if, if I think you're peculiar. Uh, or don't, whatever. Um, but there would be pictures, of course, on social media of these altars, these home altars. And in the very center of the home altar was the television. And I'm not talking little TV, right? I'm talking like 65-inch, flat screen, you know, plasma TV that... It was lovely, but that's the focal point of it. And then there would be a little statue of Mary over here, and maybe you know a statue of something over here, and a crucifix, and maybe some candles. And you know that I think for the circumstances, you know that probably suited those circumstances. But that's not what I'm really talking about when I say have a space set aside. I think it's very important, important that we think about where we live. You know, we think about the home that we live in and what, what's the purpose of that home. It's to provide shelter, protection from the elements. It's to be a place of love. It's to be a place of formation, of growth. It's to be a place of uh, encouraging you know, the family's growth and holiness. It's to be a place where we're nourished by food and by each other's company but it should also be a place where we can hide away in quiet and prayer. Because that's a necessary element of our lives is to engage in relationship with the Lord. And not everybody has access to the Blessed Sacrament 24-7. Not everybody has a chapel separated in their house or a separate room that's dedicated just to prayer. Some people certainly do. Uh, I remember when I was uh, a new Catholic, and I was even when I was in the process of becoming Catholic, I set up a section of my my bedroom with you know what I called my altar. It was basically um, it was basically the the dresser that I put holy images on, and I got some holy water from the church, and I put holy water there, and I put my Bible there, and I put an image of Jesus, and maybe a crucifix, and some candles, and that was a place that reminded me of drawing out of myself and into the presence of God. It is ideal to create a space dedicated to prayer and nothing else. This was the issue with the, the home altars with the television in the center. I wonder, did they take the images of Jesus and Mary down when they were watching Jurassic Park or, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street or, God forbid, they were watching The Bachelor? (laughs) I don't know. I probably wouldn't have if it was me because, you know, laziness is kind of, it's a lot easier than moving things and juggling things around and being attentive to holy and sacred things. The space in which we pray needs to be a space that's set apart, right? You don't go into the kitchen to use the bathroom. You don't go into the bedroom to cook pancakes. 
You don't go into the garage to sew or to wash, well, maybe you do wash your car, your clothes in the garage, I don't know. These spaces are set apart. The kitchen is for food things and feeding and eating and, and communing with one another in that sense. It's for preparation of, of those things that nourish our bodies. The bedroom is the place where we rest. It's the place where we're revived. It's the place where we find refreshment. The bathroom is the place where we do our ablutions and other things. Um, these rooms are set aside for a specific purpose, and it's very easy for us to say, I don't have a television in my bathroom. I hope nobody in here has a TV in their bathroom. That'd be weird. I don't have a toaster oven in my bedroom, you know, because those things don't belong in those spaces. The same thing is true about our space for prayer. Our space for prayer needs to be a space that is set aside specifically for that. And that's the place that we go when we want to be in communion with God in that particular kind of way. You know, God's around us in all places. He's in the bathroom, in the bedroom, in the kitchen, in the garage, in the basement. Um, but in a very particular way, when we go into that prayer space, we need to be reminded of what we're about in there. So that means there needs to be holy reminders, holy reminders. We come into this conference room and we have holy reminders all around us. We've got the Stations of the Cross and we have... Uh, an image over here of, uh, I assume that's a version of Our Lady of Mount Carmel because of the scapulars. And then over here we have Rosa Mystica over in the corner. So we're reminded that we're surrounded by the Blessed Mother. We're reminded of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross because our attention is drawn to this um, very large crucifix up here on the wall. These holy reminders help us recognize what our focus needs to be. And so in those spaces... It would be a good idea to have things that will aid us in recognizing holy things. In other words, let's have some icons. Let's have some uh, beautiful sacred art. Let's have some statues. Let's have some candles. Let's have a crucifix. Let's have a place to sit. Uh, and it can be comfortable. Don't worry. It's okay for your chair in your chapel area to be comfortable. You don't want to be too comfortable because you don't want to necessarily fall asleep. But to set aside a place that is dedicated for that specific purpose of going deeper in relationship with God, first off, it's an investment. It's an investment in eternity. It's an investment in your relationship with the Lord. But also, these holy spaces, these holy uh, images, these holy reminders help us to desire holiness on a deeper level. You know, when we look at a picture of our favorite saint, we want to emulate that. We're encouraged and we're inspired by that. When we see a beautiful, um, a beautiful painting, a sacred art, it draws us out of ourselves and it puts us into that place of awe and wonder. When we go into a beautiful church, you know, a church that is ornately decorated. You know, what's the purpose of that ornamentation? The purpose of that ornamentation is not to serve as a distraction, but it's to serve to draw us out of ourselves and the, you know, the mundane ways that we live our lives out of the ordinary and into the extraordinary. That's why I think it is absolutely uh, necessary and absolutely, um, you know, it's, it's of utmost importance that our churches are beautiful. We settle too often for churches that are not full of beauty. And when we don't have a place to worship that's beautiful, it's hard for us to embrace beautiful things. One of the issues that I think we have post-Vatican II, or not really even Vatican II, but post-1965, 1970, was the destruction of the beauty of our churches. You know, there was a movement. I was recently told um, by a parishioner that, you know, one of the priests um, shortly after the implementation of the changes in the in late 60s, early 70s, that one of the pastors told the people that, you know, they had to get with the times and they had to, um, 
They had to make changes in the church. They had to take out the communion rail. They had to take out the altars, the high altar, and they had to install a, a, a table altar. They had to remove the statues and change the painting and, and do all these things. And, and the people were threatened by this priest, and I would say other priests probably used these tactics as well. They were threatened, well, if we don't do this, the diocese will go and shut the, shut the parish down, which is just wholly not true. And so what did they do? They chucked the beautiful altars and the beautiful statues and the communion rails and, and all these holy reminders. You know, they got stacked in barns or they got thrown into burn piles or they, you know, were chopped up and put in people's attics or basements or turned into, you know, flower stands in people's homes. To be replaced by what? Modern art. Modern art. Now, mind you, it's 1960s, 1970s modern art. So we're talking Partridge Family-esque uh, Brady Bunch churches. Now help me understand something. And that was rhetorical. I don't really want to understand it. How does that elevate the mind and heart to God. I don't understand that myself. And now there seems to be a movement that's kind of butting up in the church to, to kind of not go back in time. It's not nostalgia because the ones who are having this, this desire for beautiful things are not people that lost those beautiful things. They're young people that never really had those beautiful things before. And so there's this movement in the church to restore the beauty of, of the church building. If you go into uh, uh, a beautiful cathedral, your heart is elevated. If you go into a bank, your heart isn't elevated. It's not. Unless you're going to, you know, take out a million dollars or something like that. Maybe your heart's elevated then. If you go into uh, your, your living room and your home, you're going to find rest and you're going to find comfort there because that's what it's supposed to be. If you go into the church and it looks like a living room, and it looks like somebody's house that's not God's house, the messages are getting mixed up. The same is true for our holy spaces. The same is true for our sacred spaces where we pray. If we want our hearts to be elevated to God, we need to put things in place that will help elevate them. Beautiful art beautiful music, things that entice our senses. Did you all know that you can burn incense at your house? And I'm not talking about that junk you buy at the grocery store. Don't, don't burn that. That's probably got a demon attached to it anyway. So don't, don't waste your time or your money on the incense that you buy at Kroger. You can get church incense. There are kits where you can, you can put together a little incense kit for your home, for your little home oratory. You can have a little oratory in your home that just takes up very little space or it can be as, an, as ornate as you wish it to be. It can look like a church. The purpose of it, though, is for, for the, the setting aside of a space dedicated for prayer. Dedicated for prayer. And this has to take into account your taste and things like that. I'm not here to really engage that so much, but have a place set aside in your home that is specifically for prayer. If you have children, have a place where they can enter into that space as well. Because as parents, your primary duty is to teach the faith to your children. It's not the duty of the parish, it's not the duty of the priest or the CCD teachers or religious ed. It's your duty. Those things, you know, the parish and the, the religious education is supposed to uh, assist you in that. A sacred space, like I said, should engage your senses. So what are our senses? We, we see, we hear, we touch, we taste, we feel. Burn incense. Light candles. Have special lighting in your areas of, of prayer. Whatever is helpful to create the atmosphere 
that fosters calm and peace and signals your mind and body and soul that it's time to pray, that it's time to step out of the hustle and bustle of the world and to step into the presence of God and into that relationship and to go a little bit deeper each time. These holy reminders, we call them sacramentals. So a sacramental... um, is anything set apart or blessed by the church to excite good thoughts and to help devotion? It's through the prayers of the church offered for those who make use of these sacramentals, as well as through devotion they inspire that they convey and obtain God's grace and blessings. The sacramentals are not unlike the sacraments in that they are channels of grace and can obtain for us certain benefits. Sacramentals. So when I say sacramentals, I'm going to get into a list of them here, but in particular, what's one sacramental that comes to mind that we would use all the time when we walk into a church? Holy water. You know, you can have a holy water font in your house. In fact, it's a pious custom to put a holy water font in every room of your house. It's a pious custom to do that. What is it that we do when we dip our fingers in that holy water? We make the sign of the cross and we're remembering and recommitting to our baptism. Holy water also that's properly exercised and blessed according to the Roman ritual is a powerful sacramental that not only helps us renew our baptism, but it also, uh, wherever, and this is from the right, wherever it is sprinkled, the, the, the wiles of darkness will be cast away. So sacramentals are channels of grace and they can attain for us certain benefits. Number one, they can be uh, something that obtains for us actual graces. Sacramentals can be um, those things that bring about forgiveness of venial sins. The remission of temporal punishment. You know, temporal punishment is that, uh, if you think about it like this, it's that, that payment that is due because of the offenses that we have made against God for sins that have been forgiven. We still have to have that temporal punishment. That's why purgatory exists. It's to purify it's to purify us. So use of sacramentals can remit temporal punishment. Use of sacramentals can bring health of body and material blessings and protection from evil spirits. One difference between sacraments and sacramentals is, not, is that the latter does not produce sanctifying grace. That is just for sacraments alone. So, you know, praying the rosary is not going to bring about sanctifying grace. Wearing your scapular is not going to bring about sanctifying grace, but it will bring about actual grace. There's a difference in these things. Another difference is that sacramentals were instituted directly, that sacraments were instituted directly by Christ, while sacramentals were instituted by Christ through his church. So they became the holy helpers to, you know, guide us and direct us into that sacramental grace, that life of the sacraments. Sacramentals should never, ever, 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 ever take the place of sacraments. You can't replace you know, um, you, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament would be a devotion, um, but some people will use that as a substitute for going to Mass. It always strikes me as odd when I see the list of names of people that are in the Perpetual Adoration Chapel, and I see the people that go and spend an hour with the Lord in prayer, but they don't come to Mass. That's peculiar to me, <laughs> it's very strange. They're not the same thing. (laughs) You can't trade one for the other. And sacramentals are the same. You can't trade a sacramental, you know, you can't just, you know, fling holy water on somebody and say, hey, you're baptized now. Yes? Enough. I've noticed it enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. It's really strange. It's very strange to me. Um. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yes? Um, I, know that, I know that sacraments can be done, performed, however, whatever, whatever verb is there, whatever. Um, not in person. Um, can sacramentals be blessed or made over the phone? Mm-mm. Nope. 
No, because it requires a sprinkling of holy water. So when you have a sacramental, like, for instance, when you get enrolled in the scapular, the very first thing that happens is the priest blesses the scapular and then he sprinkles it with holy water. So if you can figure out how to get holy water through a telephone line, probably figure that out, right? That's not going to happen, though. So there's, there's necessary parts to the blessings, um, that means they have to be in person. So that's, you know, when somebody brings me, people bring me lots of stuff to bless. I, I've, I've oftentimes, um, after first Saturday Mass, I'll have uh, some people that have literally the back of an SUV or the back of a pickup truck full of jugs of water and pounds of salt and gallons of olive oil and rosaries and statues and candles and all these things to be blessed because they know how important those blessings are and not every priest will do the blessing. You know, they'll just say, May Almighty God bless this object in the name of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit. Now that is a blessing, but there's no oomph to it, right? So uh, there's, there's this, there's this uh, idea that floats about, and I agree with it. Um, God knows what we need, obviously, right? And our Lord says... Uh, Ask anything in the name of the Father and he will give it to you, right? So God responds to what we ask of him. So if I ask God to send his blessing down upon this piece of paper, I can make the sign of the cross over it and we can trust that it's now a blessed piece of paper. That, I don't know how that's going to impart any kind of actual grace, right? I don't, I don't know that, how that's going to work, but there is a ritual and a rite, R-I-T-E, for the blessing of things. There's blessings for boats and ambulances and uh, beer and whatever that was. And <laughs> speaking of beer, there's blessings for all these things. And the reason that they exist is because it's a particular, you know, asking God for a particular, uh, a particular pouring out of his grace upon that thing. You know, so... Um, I can just wave my hand over something and, you know, call it blessed, but I can also use what the church has provided for, you know, 15, 1,600 years for a blessing. And, and there's something more rich about that. Do you find that that mass blessing of things, like when they come in this drove, is that cross-cultural? I know, like, within our parish... It can be. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't really noticed a, I haven't really noticed a big difference. I mean, when people, usually my experience is when people find out that there's a priest that will say the traditional blessings, everybody's coming, you know, because they want exercise salt. They want candles that have the exorcism on them they want those things so you know exorcism not in the sense of like um you know it's you know head spinning around and there's vomit and it's crawling across the ceiling but it is a it is a casting out of of any kind of demonic influences that might be in that created thing um so my experience is i, I people come from all over the place you know uh, I mean, I'm talking like Rushville and, and, and Indianapolis and all that. And it's not that there aren't priests that won't do it there, but they know that, that I will because I have the books and I, I will say those prayers. Yes? There's a friend of mine that told me that you can make your own holy water. You boil the hell out of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be done by a priest. Right. You can't make your own holy water. Holy water? What? No. <laughs> That's a joke. I told my mom, the, the Baptist mother that I have, I have so many stories. I could tell you guys like days of stories about my mom. Um, but there was one day, when, growing up, I couldn't, there was not a bad word that I could ever say, which is probably a good thing. I mean, I couldn't say like but or darn or anything like that. Mom had no patience for that. So if she even thought that I was thinking it, I was, you know, she was after me. So after I was ordained a priest for a few years, I said something about holy water. And my mom, well, what makes it holy? And I could have 
said, well, mom, there's a prayer that I say, and I asked God to, to take its, you know, blah, blah, whatever. I didn't. I, I said, mom, holy water is holy because you boil the hell out of it. And I just, like, dead pander. And she said, really? No, mom, it's a joke. And then I kind of backed up because I thought she was going to start swinging at me. So, <laughs> my, uh, yeah, I've got parishioners that will ask me, well, Father, uh, we were told that if you have a container of holy water and it starts to run low, all you have to do is put more water in it as long as the extra water you put in it doesn't equal the amount of holy water that's in it, then it's all holy water. Um, I've, never, I've never heard that. There is no authority in the church that has ever said that that made any sense to me. So I don't, I don't believe that that is a good... If that's a custom that you have of, you know, uh, get your holy water by the gallon instead of, you know, the little bottles. If you, if you don't, don't add water to it because I don't, I don't trust that that works. It could. I mean, with God, all things are possible, right? You know, but, um, you, yeah, I don't, yeah, I, you know, we, yeah, uh, yeah. So, what? To be safe, follow the formula. Do what the church has done for, you know, 15, 1600 years, and you'll be okay. Aaron. Yeah. If he doesn't sprinkle the holy water on it. Yeah, it's still blessed, um, but you know it's no umph. No it's a light blessing. No, it's not. It's still a blessing. But <laughs> even if Father just does this, you know, I when I was um, when I was coming into the church, I would take things to the priest, and um, he he was still a little bit old school, and I, I'd never heard any Latin before until I would take him something, and I remember I bought this Saint Benedict cross that was like this big and I used to wear it around my neck and I took it to father and I said father would you bless this for me and he took it and held it in his hands and he in omni patri said fide et spiritus sancti amen and he handed it to me and I'm like what on earth did you just say <laughs> I'd never heard latin before so I didn't know what what he had done and I remembered that um there was probably in the late 60s or early 70s uh there were some questions about like in a pinch can the priest just pronounce the words of the of the cross over the object and it be blessed? And that was that was the case. So it, it definitely um, definitely can do that. But you know that would be like going to a baptism, and uh, the deacon or the priest, you know, there's that prayer of blessing for the water, but he just you know says in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Now it's holy water. Is it holy water? Probably. Um, is it? You know, as uh, solemn as it should have been for that moment, definitely not. So, uh, yes, you, if if that little piece of it is is omitted, that doesn't take away from the blessing part of it. Yeah. It's twenty six pages long. Yeah. Spiritual napalm. Yeah, that's the, word he used. the whole the epiphany water. Yeah, I do it every year, every year, like forty or fifty gallons of it. We call it high octane holy water. Is what we call it down in. Did you say four hundred fifty gallons? No, forty or fifty gallons. Oh, I do it a swimming pool at a time. <laughs> Yeah, if if you jump in and it burns, then you know that it's good stuff. His his uh, his recirculating pool is swim spa. Yeah, I that's the you know that's a big question, right? Like, well, you know, kids say, well, father, can you make the ocean holy water? Sure. Speaking of kids, yes, go ahead, Rob. <laughs> Blessed, you go and bless 
Um, if they ask me to. Our new deacon is going and blessing homes before they do a baptism. The new deacon's her husband. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you said that. Why didn't you say my deacon? You could have said that too, though. But that, yeah, so that, that kind of, is, that, that's a good thing to do. Well, he's doing it so that they can make him to blessed Yeah. And one of the homes, it was really cool because he was very excited. The dad was, is being deployed, and he blessed all his stuff that he's taking with him. Oh, that's really cool. And blessed the family dog because the little boy wanted to bless. Yeah. Yeah, so that, I'm glad you brought that up because a, a very important thing for you to do every year is to have your home blessed. You don't just do it once. Um, and if you're one of those, uh, if you're one of those families that likes to change the interior of your house often, you know, you change the paint color, you move furniture around, all that kind of stuff. It's just a good idea to have your house blessed. Um, and if weird stuff starts happening in your house. There are prayers that the priest can come and say that are exorcism prayers that, that help with that. Yes? And every time we have a brand new car, we always have a priest bless our car, too. Well, you know, here's, here's my thing about blessing cars. I, would, I used to not bless cars because every time I would bless one, the very next day the person got into a car accident. And I'm not talking about like this happened once or twice. I'm talking literally like every time I blessed a car. No, it wasn't them. And no, they don't go to my church. Um, but I, people would say, Father, will you bless my car? And I'm like, do you want an accident? <laughs> like, do you want to get in a car accident? What do you mean? I'm like, that's what happens. But I'm, I do it now if somebody asks, and I, it hasn't been a problem lately. But What's that? They have. Yeah, they have. I guess. I guess. But, I, it, you know, it, it, it did have me a little nervous there for a little while. There was a little stition there, but not a whole lot. It wasn't superstition, but, um, you, know, you know, you get wigged out for weird, like, little weird things, so. You should do that every night before you go to bed. Yeah, yeah. Especially fathers, you know, if you have kids at home, fathers, bless your children, bless your wives, bless the house with holy water before you go to bed. Every night before I go to bed. Go to my chapel, make a little visit to Jesus, pray Compline, and then I uh, I sprinkle everything upstairs, the bedrooms, my bed, the walls, everything gets sprinkled with holy water. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. When I get on an airplane, that plane is blessed. <laughs> Not. I do it. I do. No, no, no. I do it so they don't see me. I do it so they don't see me. But I will say, I have. There have been times where I've gotten on a plane and people have been like, "Oh, thank goodness." Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but yeah, it is a good idea to keep holy water in your house and use it. Use it. Bless yourself with it. Bless your children with it. Bless your house with it. Now, your blessing is not the same as my blessing, right? You know, uh, I have a priestly blessing, a ministerial priestly blessing. That is different than, you know, uh, a father you know, giving a blessing to his children or something like that. Rob, did you have another? Yeah. So, someone asked this type of question, and it, and it popped in a bigger question into my head. But... Um, one time, I believe it was on Catherine Amster's Live or on Mysterious World, Jimmy Aiken. Oh, yeah. Way it was Jimmy Aiken. And someone asked if the ocean could be blessed, yada, yada. And, and he always takes every question very seriously. Right. Especially, you know, with the kids to give them a good, um, clear answer. And he said, well, a lot of times blessings come down to um, authority. Yeah. And he, one of the things he said was, so your priest, no, they wouldn't be able to bless the ocean, not the way you're thinking. He said, but a bishop of the area or, you know, the Pope could technically bless it because that's their faith. Like, the yeah, the Pope's territory is the all of the world. world. Yeah. So he said, yes, but then that got me thinking from the little kid question to the big kid question. We have a huge uh, number of people. Uh -huh. We put them in the ground. There's only so much ground. 
Right. And we shouldn't put people in places that aren't blessed or whole. I don't know the exact wording of that, but like, if there, if the oceans were blessed, would we not be able to put our dearly departed in the ocean? We can. And not take away a ton of space where homeless people. We can already do that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's a right in the in the burial book for burial at sea. Yeah, not on that point. You're not. Well, I mean, I know some people will be like, "Well, the fish will eat them with good." Okay. Well, I mean, you know, like, don't think about where the sausage is made or how it's made. Just enjoy it, right? Yeah, like, I just, I work in, in Louisville. I know there, I know every city is this way, but there's just this massive, massive amount of homeless people, and I just think of. All you want to toss them all in the sea? No, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> is that where we're going? Is that where we're going? I, 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 Uh, just, yeah. But they have to be treated with, with dignity and respect, yeah. Yeah, after, you know, I just so brought that up. Your mind is an amazing, amazing place, isn't it? <laughs> I have fun with it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say, my grandma came from Ireland like in 1920. And I just tell Sharon. She's from County Cary? You related to Brenda back there? Uh oh. She was a very she devout Catholic. Dark, dark, dark. Very devout Catholic. Rosary three times a day. She was squirted with holy water. It was like an Adonis fucking liquid. Like, pfft. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> she was amazing, but I'm just telling her. Here today, when she came over, there were a lot of people that died on the boat because of severe sickness. Right. Sentences. Yeah. And she said they went to so many burials at sea. Yeah. Yeah, you couldn't keep them on the boat. Yeah. They got the holes. They had. They were known as coffin ships. Particularly during the famine years, for about twenty years after that, during the nineteen eighteen fifties and sixties and so on, they had the holes, and the holes would open up, and they would drop them through the holes. Now the problem was that during that twenty twenty five year period, a lot of the commanders and ship masters. Knew that a lot of the Irish coming off the ports of the Cove and, and West Port and uh, Galway and all the rest would not make that journey over. So it was a profitable venture for them, for people to get, who were leaving to get out of Ireland to try and make it over and knowing how long we're going to die. Yeah. Anyway, so. Well, I'm glad my grandma made it because she was uh, fabulous. And yeah, that's 1920 is a bit different from 1850. Huh? Yeah. That's pretty awesome that she would squirt you with a. Dawn dish bottle yeah, full of holy, holy water. Oh, I bet. Fast? She, yeah, fast. fast. She loved Jesus and she loved us. That's awesome. One prayer for the uh, souls in purgatory, you know, says pray for the people that was uh, bearing at the sea. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I mean, I've never, obviously, we don't have an ocean near us, so I've never had the opportunity to do a burial at sea, but I would do it. You know, if somebody asked me and they wanted to pay my plane ticket to, <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah, uh, you know, Rob, you were you were talking about like the land and the like authority, and you know, the Pope could could do it. But do you all know who the Bishop of the Moon is? You would be the one that did. There is a Bishop of the Moon. Yeah. It's the Bishop of Orlando, Florida. Yeah. It's the Bishop of the Moon. It's the Bishop of the Moon, yeah. Because that's where, that was the diocese where the, the moon landing took off and returned to. And so that was his territory. <laughs> so at least if I ever go to the moon, I'll know who to say and for our Bishop... He probably has not made a pastoral visit. <laughs> He's, he might be afraid of heights. He might be afraid of heights. Okay, let's keep going on here. Um, one more thing, a couple things I want to talk about. The scapular. Um, 
the scapular, I think, is uh, it's kind of confused, or a lot of people are confused about the scapular. The scapular was given to St. Simon Stock by Our Lady in 1251 in England. And he was, he was a Carmelite priest who uh, the Order of Mount Carmel, the Carmelites, the Little Brothers of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel, they started in the early 1200s or late 1100s, and they started a religious congregation at Mount Carmel in the Holy Land. Um, and when the Muslim invasion started kind of taking over, they, they were kind of scattered. And so they went to France, they went to uh, England, they went to other places throughout Europe. But St. Simon Stock was the, he was the superior of the Carmelites in England, and Our Lady appeared to him, and she gave to him the brown scapula. And she said, whoever is wearing this, at the moment of their death, will not suffer eternal flames. And so some people will say, well, that means I, that's a get-out-of-hell-free card for me. So all I have to do is put the scapular on, and I don't have to worry about going to hell. That's not how that works. The scapular comes with, uh, comes with some obligations. Uh, we were just talking about this not 20 minutes ago. Those obligations are, there's three obligations. Number one, you have to wear it, but to wear it, you should be enrolled in it. And to be enrolled in it, you have to have a scapular. You've got to take it to a priest and ask the priest to do it. And there's certain prayers that he will pray to enroll you in that scapular. And then you have to wear it. Wear it all the time. Wear it all the time. I tell people if you, you know, if you're a particularly sweaty person or if you, like, work out a lot or what, I have two scapulars. Have the, the one that you can get dirty and the one that you can, you know, keep clean. So you wear the scapular. You pray the prayers of uh, the Blessed Mother every day. And so uh, traditionally those prayers were the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary. But for most people, that can be, you know, if, if they ask, that can be um, uh, the priest can, can give them dispensation to pray the rosary in place of those. Um, so you can pray the rosary, pray the rosary every day, or pray the little office of the Blessed Mother, or pray all of those. You can do all of those too. And then you live in your, uh, in your vocation chastely. So whatever your state of life is, you live chastity in that. There's marital chastity, there's celibate chastity, there's religious, ch- you know, there's, you know, chastity. Um, and the promise is that if you live up to these obligations, if you strive to live up to these obligations, then at the moment of your death, you can be assured that you're not going to die outside of a state of grace. There are some awesome stories called the miracles of the scapulars. There's this one story of a, a man who was, <clears throat> he was away from, uh, away from the faith. He, he, he grew up Catholic and he stopped practicing his faith, but he always wore a scapular. And he was walking on train tracks or something like that. Anyways, he got hit by a train. The man got hit by a train, and it split him in half. And he stayed alive until a priest was able to get to him to hear his confession and to give him uh, uh, the the final sacraments. And then he he died shortly after that. There's another story of an old soldier um, in France that, uh, you know, he he became quite ill um, and he was walking and a voice came to him and said, go to St. Peter's church and confess your sins to this priest. And so he went into the church and the priest was in there and he confessed his sins. And, um, oh, the reason he became ill is because he tried to kill himself. He took poison. And so he goes and he confesses this to the priest and the priest says, well, I got to, I got to take you to the hospital. And so they go to the hospital and the doctors are trying to help him and, and the man just dies. Like he has no pulse nothing. They can't do anything about him. And so the priest just kneels down at his bedside and he says these prayers and all of a sudden the man starts breathing again. And the doctor said it's a miracle because the poison that he took should, you know, he should be dead. There's no reason that he should be alive. So it's a miracle. And the priest said, let's not, let's not jump the gun here. Let's find, let's figure out what's going on. And he asked the guy, do you have some kind of prayer life? Did you keep the faith? And the man said, no, I haven't practiced my faith in, in a long, long time. But I've always worn my scapular. And so he had that scapular on, 
um, and Our Lady. And, and remember, he would have been, you know, he would have confessed his sins, so Our Lady made sure that he was taken care of. Now, it's not a good luck charm. Some people look at it as a good luck charm. Some people look at all the sacramentals as a good luck charm, but it's not. It's not a lucky rabbit's foot. It's not, uh, you know, some kind of, um, you know, little thing that we can have that, that brings about good luck to us. It's something that instills in us, number one, a desire for a deepening relationship with God because his goodness comes through that. We can receive his graces through the utilization, proper utilization of the sacramentals. And it's also something that reminds us of what we're really about. You know, the sacramentals, if used properly, they help us to know that, that we're destined for heaven. We're destined for something greater than what we have here. And so we have to keep that in mind. When we embrace the holy things, when we have the holy reminders, when we set up these sacred spaces, we need to fill them with, uh, with things that are going to help us recognize that this is not our home, that will instill in us a longing for heaven because it doesn't matter how beautiful uh, a piece of art is. It doesn't matter how, how beautiful an icon is or how well uh, a statue is sculptured. It doesn't matter how wonderfully decorated a church is. It pales in comparison to the beauty of the beatific vision. And that's why beauty is so important because it's supposed to direct us out of the mundane, out of the normal, out of the, the usual... Uh, things that we experience every day and to cast us into that deep desire for heaven. And so when you create your space for prayer, wherever it is, have that in mind. It's supposed to be a little taste of heaven. Just a little taste of heaven. Now, what about if you pray in your car? There are these really cool things that you can get in your car. There are car icons. You can, uh, you know, you have those... uh, um, there's air fresheners that like stick in your vents. Well, they make a little icon that you can like pop in your vent, and so you can have a little holy space in there too. Don't put anything in your car that's going to be a distraction and cause you to kill somebody. We don't want that. Um, that would kind of contradict the whole idea of the prayer thing. <laughs> what were you doing? Were you drinking and driving? No, I was praying. I was praying. <laughs> yeah, I was meditating while I was driving. <laughs> Father, on the, uh, on the uh, scapulars, is every scapular you own, and after you've been enrolled, still a blessed scapular? Or does the physical new one have to be? Technically, after you are enrolled in it, you can just put on a new scapular. But I tell people a blessing from a priest isn't going to hurt anything. So you can you can always have it blessed. I heard that yeah, technically it's it's perpetual. Yeah, it's a perpetual thing. Yeah, there's no harm. I've I've blessed. Yeah, I've yeah, loads of them. Just an FYI, I came across probably the best. You know, scapulars can get worn, mm-hmm. and you get ones that which really cheap, and the image of Christ goes offered. Yeah. Really? Yeah, it's tremendous. Um, we're wearing it now. This guy. It's made of pure lamb's wool. Oh, wow. And, uh, Is it itchy? No. Oh. No, it's not. That's too bad. But it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm like, you know, like, you, you, you get reminded, right? Like, you, you, you're digging at your chest because you're like, oh, yeah, I got my scapula on. Cut the pockets. Yeah, no, the material in between is kind of a stronger material. Yeah. And it, just, it can tear at you, right? Yeah. Well, uh, this one. Does he, have a, does he have a website? Yeah, he's, uh, he, yeah, he does through eBay. Okay. Yeah. What's well. his username? Um, gosh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but um, I, 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 I bought this capture uh, from him about two and a half, three years ago, and it almost, this, besides the picture, Yeah. You get what you pay for with scapulars, definitely. So if you're going to wear one, pay good money for it. Oh. Well, the one I have on is $25, but I, I destroy them 
very, very easily. Yes. Thank you. What's the weirdest thing I've ever blessed? Hmm. No, I just uh, maybe. No, I haven't done that. The weirdest thing I've ever blessed. No, a person, <laughs> a very strange person. Um, no, no, there's blessings for grapes was weird. <laughs> grapes was weird um, because, yeah, they were weird. Um, brandy, that was kind of strange. But there's literally in the, in the Roman ritual, there, there's a blessing for um, a seismograph, for a fire engine, for an airplane, for a boat, for... Um, No, I'm just saying those, there's blessings for those things. So I, they're probably, you know, there's a blessing for alcohol, yes. So you can, the blessing for beer. Because, you know, like in Germany and Europe, you know, those places where the monks made all that beer, they would, of course, bless it, you know, and then it was holy beer, holy beer. Yeah, the, the the bees. Yeah, Which is cool. yeah. The it's that that is a neat blessing. Yes, Marie. Really random question, but like, or like, can you bless animals like chickens and like mm-hmm. that kind of stuff? Yep. You don't have to do it individually, right? Like, you know, if there's a, a flock of chickens. Like fifty chickens. Yeah, I you, you just yeah you would fling the holy water, you know, okay. but. I could tell you some stories about chickens. <laughs> um, after they're uh, after they're blessed, probably. They're always juicy. They're always going to be juicy, yeah, Janet. So, um, so the, the, the standard was to pray the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mother, but most people don't have access to that. So the, the priest would give a dispensation instead of doing that, uh, particularly for people that couldn't read. Praying that Psalter would be really hard. So they would get dispensation to pray the rosary in place of that. Um, so you're fine. You're fine. You have to go back all those days, and you got to. <laughs> no, you're fine. That was almost a year ago, wasn't it? It was. It's a lot of prayers. It's a lot of prayers. Other questions? Anything else? Okay. Well, why don't we pray Compline to end?